from Wingate University and WUTV. This is Wingate Today. Coming up, televising Bulldog sports to a worldwide audience on ESPN. He paints with precision how Wingate lured a renowned artist to campus. But first, pomp and circumstance, commencing the 120th session. Hello and welcome to Wingate Today. I'm Jeff Atkinson. The academic year at Wingate University began in tradition with the opening convocation. This year, for the first time, the event was held outdoors in the academic quadrangle in front of the Burris Building, the school's first classroom building. This setup allowed for first-year students to pass through the gate, Wingate's iconic structure that stood for decades. And the plan is, when they graduate, they'll exit the quad through the same archway. During convocation, students, faculty, and staff gather in a formal setting. The president outlines his vision for the academic year, and students recite the honor code. This marked Dr. Rhett Brown's first convocation as president. When we gather in this same spot and celebrate your commencement, we will know that you are ready to major in a great life. We will miss you when you are gone, but you will be our student forever. I love these oaks. <laughs> I love these institutional traditions. I love the symbols that whether or not we know they have meaning in our life, later we will discover they really do. I'm a little nervous, a little anxious, um, I'm ready to get involved. I'm excited. More than 1,200 people attended the opening convocation in the academic quadrangle, marking the start of Wingate School's 120th year. A new year beginning for 113 future pharmacists, Wingate School of Pharmacy welcomed first-year students, known as P1s, into the program in mid-August with a white coat ceremony. About 1,000 people were in the audience at Austin Auditorium as faculty from the pharmacy school helped incoming students put on white coats. The ceremony is a gesture of welcome and new responsibility for Doctor of Pharmacy candidates. The WUSOP class of 2019 includes 98 students on the campus in Wingate and 15 in Hendersonville. This year's cohort ranges in age from 19 to 47 years old and students come from 11 states. This year's class of undergraduates is the largest in the school's history, with a record number 739 new students. Also, it's the strongest academically, according to the university. The number of undergraduate students, first generation, the first in their family to go to college, 30 percent. Total enrollment for fall 2015, graduate and undergraduate, is 3,148. For the fourth year in a row now, recipients of the Porter B. Byram Scholarship gathered during the opening week of school for a photo to thank their benefactor. Mr. Byram, as you may recall, gave a record $21 million to the university in 2012, the largest one-time gift in school history. Wingates used the money for campus construction and renovations and established an endowment to fund scholarships, which 216 students received this year from Mr. B. I really want to thank him for making a dream come true. That's something that, you know, college of, I've always wanted to go to college, and without his help, none of this would have been possible. Tuition goes up every year, and you need the help from other people. So that way you can go out into the world and prosper, and then hopefully give back to the school, or give back to the kids that are later on going to be in school. In addition to the photo, which will be framed and given to Byram, students wrote individual thank you notes. Those will be mailed to Mr. B. He turned 95 in August and lives in Charlotte. It's the premier international exchange program of the United States, the Fulbright Award. 10,000 Americans apply each year and only 800 are selected. This year, two Wingate alums are in that prestigious group. It was Winter National, Wingate Study Abroad Seminar to China in 2013, where George Boyan caught the bug, a love of travel and seeing the world. I'd always dreamed about being able to go overseas and be able to teach or find a way to do that and get paid for it, basically. His twin desires came true this spring when Boyan won the coveted Fulbright Award. I couldn't believe it, honestly. It was just so surreal. For the next nine months, this Kernersville native will be in Turkey teaching English, speaking and listening skills at Ataturk University, a public university of about 40,000 students in Ezrum in eastern Turkey. We caught up with him at the Charlotte airport before he left in late August. I have to teach at least 20 hours a week, um, so it could be a bit of a demanding teaching schedule. But a year teaching social studies at North Forsyth High School in Winston-Salem, his first job, helped prepare him. 
Boyan credits mentor Stephen Hyland, Wingate history professor and Fulbright scholar himself, with helping him get to this point. Hyland proudly tweeted the news when it broke. Is he nervous going to a volatile region of the world? I guess I'm a little nervous, uh, more excited than anything, but it's definitely right there in the back of my mind because of where I'm going to be. But he says he feels safe. Fulbright operates under the auspice of the U.S. State Department. Boyan feels like he is in good hands. Wingate's second Fulbright scholar is 24-year-old Grace Krauser, a former volleyball standout. She was notified in August she will teach English in Brazil. Krauser collected a slew of awards during her time at Wingate. She received the C.C. Burris Award at the 2013 commencement, the award given to an outstanding senior woman. A semester abroad in Argentina sparked her interest overseas. Krauser leaves for Brazil in February. 55 Wingate freshmen got a head start on college. They enrolled a week early in a new program called BIOS, Biology Intensive Orientation Seminar. BIOS is designed to strengthen students' academic skills and sciences, getting them ready for freshman biology. This is the way you take notes, this is your learning assessments, um, this is a difference between a high school and a college exam. A highlight of BIOS, a problem solving exercise called the Wu Outbreak. Students use lab skills, critical thinking, and DNA to track the source of a fictitious disease outbreak on campus. Now that school's in session, professors can tell which biology students took BIOS. I definitely see a difference because they're comfortable with me and they're the loudest in my classes. They're willing to speak up, answer, ask questions. Studies have shown programs like this one significantly improve graduation rates and help prepare students for graduate and professional school. BIOS is just part of a broader network of programs designed to help students succeed in school. Wingate Today's Sharon Foote has more. Student Jillian Malloy didn't have to look for help in her transition to college life. Wingate University assigned someone to help her and does the same for all first year students. When you come in as a freshman, uh, depending on your situation, you, get, you might get assigned a success coach, you might get assigned an academic advisor, and what they primarily do is they give you the tools in order to be successful in your academic and your social life. One of Wingate's success coaches is Alex Finley. I think one of the great things about Wingate, and one of the reasons I love working here, is because the faculty and staff really work together in order to help students succeed. Students meet at least monthly with their success coaches talking about things like roommate issues, homesickness, and almost always classwork. I think one of the problems that a lot of incoming freshmen or high, obviously they used to be high school seniors come in with is they do have that perception, oh I didn't have to study in high school so I don't have to study now. That is a rude awakening when they come into college. In their first semester, all Wingate undergraduates take a one-hour credit course called Gateway 101. Writing Center Director Kevin Winchester says students learn how to get involved on campus and be successful in the classroom. It's not really academic as much as it is getting the new student acclimated to our campus and our environment. Through the Gateway class, regular classes, and advising, Wingate students are reminded of the resources available to them. One of the great resources that we have on campus is our Academic Resource Center. Um, and just being able to go there on your own timetable, schedule an appointment with a tutor. The academic uh, tutors they have are free and a lot of campuses don't have that option and Wingate does. It's very relaxed, it's not, it's a non-threatening environment. It's other students helping students. So they act as coaches, they're not teachers per se. The students that do really well in classes and that are getting A's and B's in any class across the board, they are the ones that are going to tutoring, that are taking advantage of supplemental instruction, um, that are going to see their professors, that are going to the writing center. The academic, emotional, and social challenges on college campuses are surprisingly high. At four-year schools, 20% of students need to take remedial courses. A different national survey found that 85% of college students say they are stressed out every day, and that's up 20 points in the last five years. It's very important for the students not to, if they start to feel overwhelmed, to seek out help, you know, whether it's going to, uh, to the, the tutoring center, to the ARC, or talking with someone on campus. We really do care about you and we want to make sure that you as an individual student are thriving here at Wingate. For Wingate Today, I'm Sharon Foote. On Wingate University's Hendersonville campus, it's full steam ahead. This month, the university signed a 20-year lease agreement with Henderson County to occupy the second floor of the new Health Sciences Center, the county's building near downtown Hendersonville. 
The 98,000 square foot facility has four tenants along with Wingate, Pardee Hospital, Blue Ridge Community College, Henderson County, and the town of Hendersonville. The Health Sciences Center is expected to open in the fall of 2016. Charting a course for the future, Wingate's new president, Rhett Brown, delivered his first State of the University address to an audience of faculty and staff who gathered in the BAT Center in mid-August. Brown challenged members of the Wingate community to develop a bold vision for the school. To get there, the universities hired higher education consultant Credo to come up with a three to five year strategic plan. Senior VP and owner Jaretta Nelson is leading that effort. In August, Credo hosted four strategic planning sessions over two days to get input from employees on where WU should be going. It's been exciting. Uh, it, there's been a lot of energy around that. I think there's been a, a clearly an awakening that, ooh, I think talking to each other could be really helpful. She says out of the listening session, several ideas have already risen to the top. This fall, Credo will collect data and work with university officials on the strategic plan with a goal of having something ready by spring 2016. With having a new president, first time in more than two decades, introductions need to be made. This fall, the university is hosting nearly a dozen meet and greet events with the 10th president, Rhett Brown. This one at Rolling Hills Country Club in Monroe in September. Brown is a two-time alum who has served Wingate for more than 25 years. The development office is inviting alums and friends of the university to meet or reconnect with Dr. Brown this fall. We told you about Americans going abroad. Well, in September, Wingate brought international athletes here. The Italian junior national volleyball team, young women ages 17 to 20, were here for an exhibition match against the Wingate Bulldogs. The two teams had lunch together before the game. The Italians won a trip to the World Championships in Puerto Rico, and they wanted to train and practice in this time zone beforehand. But there are other benefits to crossing the pond early. Anytime you're in a new country, hearing another language, just getting a different culture, feeling something new, uh, it's, it's immeasurable, you know, how much that can help you. The Italian team, ranked number five in the world, beat the Bulldogs in four out of the five sets played. This international team features several Olympic prospects. The game, by the way, was telecast internationally and made history. Jake Levy of the Wingate Sports Network joins us to explain. That's right, Jeff. Starting this fall, Bulldog home contests will be broadcast live on ESPN3. The first ever NCAA Division II school to sign an exclusive agreement with the worldwide leader in sports. I took a look at how this monumental deal was achieved and what it means for Wingate University. There's a dog pile! The Wingate Bulldogs are known for their athletic dominance. They've won nine straight Sack Eccles Excellence Cups. And this summer, the Bulldogs notched another big win, this time by their broadcasting department. I, I'm just so excited about the opportunity that ESPN is going to give our student athletes and the visibility that the, the university and our athletic program is going to have. Wingate home contests will be streamed live on ESPN3 beginning this fall. Wingate Director of Broadcasting and Video Production, Ryan Brown, is the mastermind behind the move. We were experiencing really good viewership during our games for the last couple of years, but really looking to go to the next level. And, you know, ESPN3 goes out to 99 million homes, so that was one of the uh, big factors for us. We wanted to let as many people uh, experience how great Wingate Athletics and the period they're in right now of, of excellence and success, and uh, it was a huge part for us. Working with Wingate yeah, Vice President and Athletic right, Director well, Steve Poston, yeah, Brown turned that like vision into right. television securing 28 home contests for live streaming on ESPN3 this fall, with even more on the docket for the winter and spring sports seasons. To go from one camera putting in tapes into standard definition cameras, and then all of a sudden we got into the world of high definition, and even then never imagined ESPN3. So it, it's been an amazing process, a lot of hard work, but a lot of fun as well. The Wingate Sports Network, led by Brown, has given student workers a chance to work in a live sport environment. Now, those students get their work showcased to a national audience. You better be good at it, you know, because <laughs> everybody's going to be watching, you know, and so it's a, it's a risk, and, and, but I think it's a risk we're willing to take, obviously, and when I'm, I'm absolutely confident with Ryan and his, Ryan Brown and his crew uh, will be a successful one. When you make a deal like this we did with ESPN3 to be the first Division II school in the country, that comes with a lot of pressure because people expect you guys to be great, be the first one, a lot of eyes on the product and see what you guys can do. And, you know, there was never a doubt in my mind that our students can handle that. I mean, they're running 
in every single one of our broadcasts. You know, that it's high level stuff for them to do. For most, this would be a great time to reflect on a job well done, but that just isn't in Wingate's DNA. I'll tell you what I'm not willing to do is say, this is the end. This is the ultimate. This is what we've gone this far. Let's stop. We don't stop here at Wingate. And that's a big reason this university has had so much success. It's so easy for our viewers to find every Wingate event, both live and on demand on ESPN3. Just head to watchespn.com and search Wingate for a full list of available events. Jake Levy, thank you very much. The Wingate family lost a dear friend this summer, Frank Davis, a former university vice president and executive director of the Cannon Foundation, died on August 24th. We interviewed him last spring for a special on former President Jerry McGee. Davis worked for McGee for six years in the early 1990s before taking over as head of the Cannon Charitable Trust in Concord. He received an honorary doctorate from Wingate at commencement in May 2013. While at the Cannon Foundation, Davis was responsible for distributing millions of dollars to Wingate and other higher ed institutions, as well as health care and human services organizations. Frank Davis was 70. At Wingate University, pharmacy school means problem solving, not just counting pills. We combine the classroom with real life experiences. I'll get my bachelor's degree in science and my doctorate of pharmacy at Wingate. And our pharmacy grads have a really high pass rate on the national exam. Wingate University also offers students bachelor's degrees. That'll give you a great head start in preparation for a doctorate in physical therapy. I get physical therapy experience in hospitals and clinics. So I'll be ready to do great work my first day on the job. Wingate University is consistently ranked as a top 10 best value in the South. And first time freshmen average nearly $22,000 in aid. Visit Wingate University, 30 miles east of Charlotte. See how you can major in a great life. The Center for Disease Control estimates 29 million Americans have diabetes. A large number of those live in the South. Break it down even more, here in Union County, areas around Wingate and Marshville have the highest number of diabetics. It's why one local group is launching an important initiative. Kristen Johnson is here now to tell us more. Jeff, Community Health Services has been in Union County for many years, but just recently they were one of seven clinics in the U.S. that was accepted to be in a program to offer free classes to pre-diabetics. Their hope is to educate people before having to medicate them. We started in 1987 as a kind of support group. Cindy Cole with Community Health Services never imagined that by 2010 this diabetic free clinic would have grown from helping 16 people to nearly 4,000. But that's only a small portion, statistics show, of people who actually have diabetes in a population Union County size. Not everyone has the insurance that they need to see the doctor, and, and not everyone has a job that that they can afford the medications, which, you know, the average insulin dependent diabetic is about $230 a month. And that's a lot of money if you don't have any insurance. So that's why folks who qualify for help come here. They're set up with a physician who shows them how to manage their diabetes. Dr. Donnie Newsom, who is not associated with the clinic but takes care of diabetic patients, notes a diagnosis such as this can be overwhelming. That's why education is key. The amputations are real, the heart attacks at an early age are real, and you know, that shouldn't scare people, it should just motivate them to find out as much as they can about it and do everything they can to prevent it. Prevention is the point of a new program Community Health Services is promoting for pre-diabetics. Partnering together with the GE Foundation, AmeriCare, and the CDC, the Union County facility is hosting a 16-course session, think of it as kind of a support group, to teach people about nutrition, exercise, and proper care to keep from becoming a diabetic. So these people are the hardest to treat and what I mean by that is they feel that, you know, I'm not sick. When you're pre-diabetic, you don't have symptoms, so it's hard to try to get someone to really focus on being, you know, in classes and doing what they need to do because they don't feel bad. Qualifications to be considered for the class include being uninsured, a blood sugar between 100 and 125, and participants must not be taking certain medications. Cole is calling on doctors as well to encourage patients to find out if they qualify to participate. 
Classes for the diabetes prevention program are slated to hopefully start in October. There still needs to be 10 people per class and there can be several classes going on at once. To learn more, give the Community Health Services of Union County a call. That number is on your screen, 704-296-0909. Thanks, Kristen. An update now and a story we've been following here on Wingate today. A longtime town commissioner in Wingate received a hero's welcome. The town threw a party of sorts on August 12th when Commissioner John Mangum came home from the hospital after a heart transplant. Well, it's just a day of celebration for our town to get John back. It's a, we celebrate because we recognize it for the miracle that it is. A huge flag was hoisted, emergency vehicles were put into place, and people lined up for where Mangum's car would pass. And he did. The homecoming a bit overwhelming. The words you can't describe. It's, it's a wonderful thing. Mangum waited on a list for 11 months before getting word in May that a new heart was available. The surgery took six hours. He spent three months in the hospital. The community followed his progress through social media. There's not anyone I've ever talked to that has had a bad word to say about John. He's involved in the university, he's involved in the, the town, he's involved in the Lions Club. There's not many parts of this community where he isn't involved. And the amount of love and the support that the community shows for him, I, I think it's a testament to his character. Mangum, a Wingate alum, is in his 18th year on the town council. He served in the volunteer fire department for 47 years. It's been three decades since the streets of Marshville heard the phrase, lights, camera, action. The motion picture, The Color Purple, was filmed in Marshville and surrounding areas during the summer of 1985. Dustin Etheridge joins us now on how the film's impact is still being felt 30 years later. That's right, Jeff. Parts of the movie were filmed in California and as far away as Kenya. However, it's the quiet town of Marshville that was transformed to reflect life in the South in the early 1900s. But for this tale of transformation, we've got to go back to the summer of 1985. More than anything, God love admiration. It was July of 1985 when director Steven Spielberg came to town to begin production of The Color Purple. It was his eighth film, and it stands out on his resume for being a shift from the summer blockbuster films he's become known for making. And Spielberg brought some famous friends with him. Danny wrong. Glover, Whoopi Goldberg, and in her feature film debut, Oprah Winfrey. To fight in my own house. Just to name a few. The streets of Marshville were transformed into a movie set, locals were cast as extras, and Union County became ground zero for Steven Spielberg's next Hollywood hit. The film's production was covered heavily by community newspaper The Union News and Home, now called The Home News and owned by Wingate University. Marshville today looks much different than it did in the summer of 85. Sure, the water tower and the train tracks are still there, but what Spielberg and his team did to the town during production seemed to inject new life into the community. Well, it caused a lot of excitement here. It did, because I don't know that there had ever been a movie filmed here before. The Marshville History Museum has its own display of artifacts and memorabilia from the color purple. And in the spirit of preservation, they had locals who were part of the film's production record their memories and accounts to these CDs. The production company provided a trailer for us. And we met Larry Fishman over there. And we sat and talked for about an hour. So they were using period wallpaper, paints, and, and materials such as that. And so they had people out there with paintbrushes, small paintbrushes, artist brushes, painting the flowers themselves to make them show up better on film. Mm -hmm. Margaret Pig from the History Museum recalls the excitement of the summer of 85 and what the movie has meant to Marshville. And a lot of money was being spent and people were being invited to be extras. And this past summer, the town held an entire week of commemoration for the 30th anniversary of the color purple including this color purple luncheon. Locals young and old gathered together for lunch and fellowship at Kate Clyde's Catering on Main Street in Marshville, recalling the glory days of their ticket to Tinseltown. The week-long celebration was capped off with a screening of the film at the Ansonia Theater in Wadesboro, as several key scenes from the film were shot in neighboring Anson County as well. So can you give me some sugar? And with the sleepy charm that Marshville brings, you don't have to be a film buff to see why Spielberg chose the town to represent small town Southern America. Many of the buildings used in the film's production were there before the color purple, and they're still here today, relatively unchanged, save for a fresh coat of paint or two. The summer of 85 was an exciting time in Marshville and Union County, and the memories made while the color purple was being filmed here. I'm not funny. He says, well will surely live on long after the credits run. The Color Purple wrapped up production in August of 1985 and was released nationwide on February 7th, 1986.
It would go on to gross more than $98 million between 1986 and 1987. The film was nominated for 11 Academy Awards and earned Steven Spielberg his first award for Best Motion Picture Director from the Directors Guild of America. But what's more important than the dollar signs and Oscars, Jeff, is that the film put Marshville, North Carolina on the map and gave audiences worldwide a glimpse of what we like to call Sweet Union. Right you are, Dustin. Thanks so much. On the subject of film, over the next eight months, Wingate University's Bat Center is presenting the Southern Circuit Tour of Independent Films and Filmmakers. The six-film series is billed as the South's only tour of emerging and experienced filmmakers. All the films are free. Topics in the documentary series range from illegal FBI spying to civil rights icon Althea Gibson. You can get more information on the Southern Circuit at batcenter.org. It's an inevitable fact of life in a changing, volatile world. There have probably been as many works of art and culture lost to history as have been preserved. Chuck Gordon joins us now with a story about how Wingate is setting out to preserve its art history. Jeff, the university has been collecting art since Bud and Ethel Smith traveled the world in the 60s. Until now, much of it has been locked in storage. This month, Wingate unwraps a dedicated space for its collection with a custom-made piece from a world-renowned artist. Wingate's collection of art is impressive and varied. Lithographs, glass bags, wire sculptures, quilts. I assumed it probably would be part of the Bat Center, you know, just a, a wing onto it. So I am just thrilled with this freestanding museum. But the Henson Art Museum needed a signature piece, and former university president Jerry McGee asked for an appears input when finding a cherry to go on top. Who was a North Carolina artist that we, that's a real stretch for us? And she said, oh gosh, of course, Ben Long. Thanks to some ambition and a sizable gift, Wingate has him. On September 24th, the Henson Art Museum will have its dedication, and the latest Ben Long fresco, True Art is to Conceal Art, will be officially unveiled. Relics of the Renaissance, frescoes are rare in the United States. The world's most famous frescoes adorn the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel at the Vatican. It takes time, patience, and a team of artists to complete one, and Long is a master of the art. He learned his craft while apprenticing for seven years with Pietro Anagoni, a noted portrait painter who was also a fresco master. That's, of course, the technique I got to learn because that's what he was doing. Long eventually brought his skills back to the Tar Heel State, painting frescoes in churches in Ashe County. He added pieces in other towns and cities, and his works over the years eventually spawned a cottage industry, the Ben Long Fresco Trail. Wingate's fresco is the tourist attraction's 14th piece. For three weeks this summer, Long and his team turned the Henson Art Museum into their own private workspace, creating a piece of art that's unique to Union County. Each day, his assistants spent hours grinding pigment, mixing plaster, and preparing the wall for Long's arrival. Long then stood or sat for hours on end, painting the lost art-themed mural. The result is a trip through time. Wingate gave Long no thematic parameters. The imagery is from elements in history that have actually happened and uh, have been lost. That includes the burning of the library at Alexandria, the cave paintings of Lescaux, and the resurrection of a lost statue. What Long is trying to say, however, is left up to the individual. I think it should be ambiguous. I mean, that's the best way to see it. That's, uh, I think if you're an optimist, it's going to look better. But some people think that this is a waste of time, so we have to see. It's impressed everyone who's seen it so far. I'm very thrilled with it. I think it's a, a wonderful kind of a learning experience as you study each part of it. I'm just so excited that our students and Union County community members can see that the fresco technique is here on this campus by one of the greatest living fresco artists. Starting September 28th, you can see Ben Long's latest masterpiece and other fantastic works of art free of charge at the Henson Art Museum weekdays from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. And if you'd like to see the full interview with Ben Long, go to youtube.com slash Wingate University and click on the videos tab. Jeff? Great interview. Thanks so much, Chuck. One final note before we close, Wingate students must have made quite an impression at the Coffee in the Quad recently. President Rhett Brown was there. The operator of the food truck featured at the event made a special point to pull the president aside. She told him that our students are some of the nicest young people she's encountered in a long time. Way to go, Bulldogs. 
And that's our show for this time. I'm Jeff Atkinson. Thanks for watching.